Hello and welcome. So today I'm going to talk about thromboembolic disorder. I'm Dr. Suparjo Azmail from Pathology Department, University of Science Malaysia. Before we start, these are the learning objectives. You can find this objective in your guidebook. So before we start, I'm going to tell you a story that are related to my lecture. This is a story of a 30-year-old man who is overweight, who had a meniscal tear. So he was admitted for a left knee meniscal tear repair. So apart from the overweight, he was fine, no, no fever, no any other symptom except for some mild pain at his left knee. He was well during admissions, the ECG was normal, there are no evidence of heart disease or lung disease. The operation was successful and it was appeared to be uneventful and patient was put on an epidural painkiller. And as you know, epidural painkiller is uh, inserted at the spine. Um, so the patient had some uh, difficulty in moving because due to the insertion of the uh, branula into the pain and uh, into the spine. So he was not moving uh, that much after the operation. So because of the insertion of the epidural uh, branula into the spine, patient is not ambulating uh, almost at all. So he was um, lying on the back for almost until five days of uh, uh, post-operations where the anesthetic teams decided to remove the epidural epidural uh, branula because of the pain uh, due to the operation is uh, reducing. So after um, the epidural uh, branula had been removed, patients start uh, to ambulate, to sit up and to walk. Um, but um, suddenly he felt a very tightness of the chest or chest pain and also complaining of difficulty of breathing uh, by explain it, by saying that he's had a uh, shortness of breath so the attending medical officer do an ECG um, immediately but the result is just a normal ECG and the sinus rhythm without any sign of uh, uh, myocardial infarction or unstable in China and they also did uh, ABG or the atrial blood gases which then showed uh, respiratory acidosis but these ABG findings improves on oxygen uh, via high flow mass the patient was um, then observed uh, and uh, kept under high flow mass for the rest of the day but to, to a surprise six hours after the first episode of chest pain this patient succumbed or died uh, in the ward and uh, there was no possible explanation seen uh, from the findings of the clinical findings so a clinical autopsy was uh, performed to find out the cause of death for this patient. Here is the aorta. You can see that my finger is just at the posterior part of the aorta. So, what I wanted to do is to assess the pulmonary trunk for this patient or for this disease. So, what I have to do is Need, I need to cut the aorta to visualize the content of the pulmonary trunk. You can see that I've already cut the aorta, where I, which I label, label as uh, in blue color, 
and uh, I also already, already cut open the pulmonary trunks so you can see that uh, the the position of the aorta and also pulmonary trunk the relationship between these two so the aorta is usually situated at the front or the anterior part of the chest and the pulmonary trunk is situated just uh, posterior to the aorta so when I cut the pulmonary trunk I can see that there's a lot of blood clot within the pulmonary trunks so at the above um, section of the pulmonary trunk you can see I'm holding a blood clot with my uh, forceps and where and the the other side of the pulmonary trunk you can see there's a saddle emboli um, where the blood clot um, sits on the bifurcation of the uh, left and right between left and right the, of the pulmonary artery. So apart from that, I also remove the heart just to see what are the content of the heart. So you can see this is just a cross section of the heart. And close up, you can see there's a mural thrombi. This, so there's a massive uh, blood clots seen in the left ventricles so this is the arrow pointing towards the mirror thrombi within the left ventricles so I uh, to demonstrate that this um, thrombi this this blood clot is actually thrombi is not and not a postmortem clot I tried to wash it with running tap water and also trying to uh, lift it up a bit using my forceps and Unfortunately, this is it cannot be removed, so it is not a postmortem clot, but it is a true mural thrombi. Okay, so back to our lecture. I will be we will discuss more on the patient at the end of this lecture. So before we start, what you need to do, you need to understand first before we start to understand regarding the thromboembolism is you need to know the coagulation cascade and also you need to know the fibrinolytic system and also the role of thrombins so I think I won't go into detail in these three topics because it will be described later when you are in the uh, I think hemato blocks so just a little bit of definition for each of um, content of my lecture number one is thrombosis what is thrombosis is actually a formation of local blood clot inside a vessels or sometimes inside the heart so next is the embolism in which an intravascular solid or liquid or gaseous mass that is carried by the blood to a site distant from its point of origins and last one is infarction is where in which area of ischemic necrosis caused by occlusion of the vascular supply to the affected tissue so you might be wondering why does our blood did not clot at all if we are alive this is because during in a living organism or living individuals humans our blood is in constant move this is due to the action of the pumping of the heart and the movement of the muscles where, where muscle pumps the blood within the veins to to move to be constantly move so that the coagulation factors that are fine in our blood is not become static and in contact with the endotheliums so because if if these coagulation factors came in contact with the endothelium it will be stimulated and will cause uh, blood clots so in view of our blood does not uh, is in a constant movement so these coagulation factors is usually being drift at the center of the blood vessels and away from the endotheliums and this will cause um, it, it, this will prevent from the uh, coagulation factors to become in contact with the endothelium and then uh, further will cause uh, blood clots in 
the living human or individuals. So to understand the thromboembolism, you need to know what might, what is the causes for thromboemboli. So the most important thing, what is the most, uh, what are the things that can cause thrombosis? So thrombosis is, is due to uh, three things or three factors. So these factors is being described by Virchow's. So this because of this we are calling we name it a virtual triad because there are three components that might cause that are causing thromboembolism number one is the endothelial injury number two is the abdominal blood flow and the last one is the hypercoagulability first we go to the endothelial injury So when there is an endothelial injury, there will be loss of endothelial lining. For example, in this case of uh, myocardial infarction, hypertension, any bacterial infection, radiation injury or toxin from cigarettes. All of these are examples of the factors that um, might cause loss endothelial in, uh, endothelial lining will cause uh, some degree of endothelial injury which, which will expose the subendothelial extracellular matrix these extracellular matrix will cause release of tissue factors and platelet adhesion molecules and also reducing prostaglandin, uh, prostaglandin 2 and plasminogen active vectors so this will stimulate uh, the platelets Soon the platelet will, will aggregate at the injury sites and cause thrombosis where it range um, between platelets and also other coagulation factors and also it, in the process it will entrap also the red blood cells. So this is what form thrombosis. The second um, factors in the virtual triad, Virchow's triad is, an, uh, is the abnormal blood flow. So you can see that, that it is caused by aneurysm of the blood vessels or the heart, uh, acute myocardial infarctions, mitral valve stenosis and also arrhythmia. So all of this factor is what cause um, abnormal blood flow. Uh, within the blood vessels and so the within the ventricles of the heart. When there is a abnormal blood flow and also um, uh, they are caused by the previous causes, this will 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 cause stasis within the vessels. So if you. If, if it is within the artery or myocardium, the tubul turbulence will cause local pocket of stasis. But within, uh, if it is occur in the vein, it is due to pure stasis, meaning the blood um, uh, in the veins become static, not not being moved at all. So this is what causing stasis and thus uh, stimulates the formations or of the thrombosis. So these are uh, example what happened in uh, artery or atrials in which had atherosclerotic plaque. So if you can see, uh, for orientation, this is uh, just the atrial wall there. You can see I label the atrial wall with the color pink and also blue. The atherosclerotic plaque is the yellowish in color, whereas the the, the content of the, uh, the inner lumen of the artery is at the center there, in between the atrial wall. So during, uh, if there is no atherosclerotic plaque, the blood will flow in a linear motion. So meaning there won't be any turbulence or anything. But in an atherosclerotic plaque, 
uh, you can see there's a turbulence of the blood flow uh, as labeled by the uh, red or pink arrow you can see on your screen so when there is a turbulence in the blood flow there will be some pocket of stasis so in this pocket of stasis where the coagulation factors and so platelets became in contact with the endothelium and caused the formations of the thrombosis or formation of the blood clots so when there is a contact with um, between the platelet and leukocyte and also coagulation, other coagulation factors with the endothelium this will further stimulate uh, the formation of the thrombos, thrombogenesis and apart from the contact between the platelet and also coagulation factors with uh, to the endothelium um, this pocket of stasis or stasis um, will cause slow washout of the activated clotting factors so and this will further prevent the inflow of uh, clotting factors inhibitors and this further stimulates the formation of the blood clots or uh, further stimulate the process of thrombogenesis so because of this uh, pocket of stasis uh, so it will further stimulate if the the, the, the stasis is become uh, very prominent uh, in the blood vessels and the last component of the Virchow's triad is the hypercoagulation coagulability so it can be divided into two parts either it is caused by primary or secondary the primary hypercoagulability is usually caused by the some genetic mutations or inherited uh, genetic disorder uh, in some of uh, humans for example in fact factor 5 mutations antithrombin deficiency and so fibrinolysis defects this will cause increase in hypercoagulability but there are also a secondary a hypercoagulability which are caused by polycythemia uh, or cancer where there is a lot of um, tumor uh, marker uh, elements or tumor uh, byproducts that can cause hypercoagulability uh, apart from that is antiphospholipid syndrome and also uh, excessive estrogen for example in, in, in uh, ladies who are pregnant or taking any uh, hormonal pill so this secondary hypercoagulability is not directly caused by any uh, disease but it is actually caused by another type of disease which are causing the blood become hyper viscous or hypercoagulability so this uh, because of this hypercoagulability state in this type of person or patients so the blood tend to become more easily to become clot clotted so there are some microscopic features of thrombus uh, for example you can see in this uh, photograph is the formation of line of zon where there is a lamination of the blood clots uh, and also platelet so you can see uh, in this photomicrograph you can see that this all this pinkish and also red color is actually blood the, the, the thrombosis within the, the one large arterioles so you can see there's some uh, area which is a pale this, uh, this and some area which are more um, darker red or darker pink uh, in color so this uh, differentiation between colors uh, that you see is actually caused by the content of uh, of the um, of the black component within it uh, the paler uh, area is formed by mostly platelets and also coagulation factors where the darker red or darker pink uh, area is usually formed by uh, the aggregations of the red blood cell which are entrapped 
in between the layers of the fibrin and so platelet so you can see this layering of the uh, uh, blood component uh, in which we describe it as line of zone so in uh, there are some chain, uh, differences between arterial and also venous thrombi uh, in uh, arterial thrombi you can see that it is formed by rich it is rich in platelet and it is usually caused by atherosclerosis or any type of vascular injuries whereas the venous thrombi is usually con the content of the venous thrombi is usually uh, red blood cells mainly red blood cells and it is usually caused by stasis and you can see venous thrombi most commonly at the lower extremities uh, and also it is also known as uh, red st or stasis thrombi well, you need to differentiate between the postmortem clot and also true thrombus or embolus. So, in the uh, in the postmortem clots, you can see the nature of the the black clot within uh, within the vessels is it look like it is more gelatinous or resemble chicken fat, and it is usually not attached to the underlying vessel wall and usually. Uh, if you wash with uh, running tap water, it will uh, um, it will easily um, detach from the blood vessels. So thrombus has uh, some different fate or progress. So, when there is a thrombus in the blood vessels, it either can be become enlarged or become propagated, or it can emboli, means it can be easily detached and blocks the distal part or distal vessels, or it can uh, become organized and recanalized, so meaning there will be some um, new blood channels or blood vessels forming to overcome the obstruction uh, caused by the thrombus or these thrombus can also become dissolved or become destroyed and and dissolved by itself so there are some uh, clinical correlation why do you need to understand regarding thrombosis thrombogenesis also emboli and all sort of things because it can help you to understand the clinical um, conditions for example in myocardial infarction or in unstable or stable angina you can see this the, 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 the main reason or the cause for the these conditions where um, you can see thrombosis or uh, within the myocardial that cause myocardial infarctions or you can see in a superficial venous thrombosis in some of the conditions in polycytemic, uh, uh, polycytemic patients or in a patient who presented with deep vein thrombosis uh, you can see a lot of these cases in the in when you posted to in the orthopedic department you can see a lot of deep vein thrombosis cases and also the if you are posted into medicals you can see also cases of thrombi on cardiac valve for example in the infective endocarditis or ischemic heart disease okay next we go on to our second topic which is the embolism so majority of embolism uh, arises from uh, thrombi so in this case we call it as a thromboembolism because it this embolism arises from the thrombosis so thromboembolism uh, now other factors that can cause embolism or other substance that can cause embolism is uh, so fat uh, fat emboli or air emboli emboli and also amniotic fluid embolism If it is caused by thromboembolism, usually uh, it will cause systemic type of embolism. So you can see disseminated a lot of uh, area, a lot of uh, organs involved with thromboembolisms. But the most common site, you can see the most affected site 
for the thromboembolism is the lungs so that's why we call it pulmonary thromboembolism usually the source is from the deep vein thrombosis and the predisposing factor is usually prolonged immobility or stasis of blood uh, in patients who are bedridden, for example, a patient who had uh, very severe um, stroke, already become stroke, and then he, he or she become bedridden, and this is a predisposing factor to develop deep vein thrombosis. And apart from that, the size of embolus usually determine the severity of the um, problems. If it is small, usually the infected um, lung or segment is uh, it will just infect the lung segment or lobes but if it is large enough it can cause sudden emboli and cause death death to the patient or person uh, for the clinical findings uh, for the small emboli usually um, it is silent usually just leave a bridging fibrous webs uh, if you take a bite say at the lung uh, for the large emboli usually cause sudden death uh, this is due to uh, sudden emboli which block the pulmonary artery and thus uh, disrupt the ventilation and perfusion for this patient or person. And apart from that, there is a medium size. If there is, it is caused by medium sized emboli, usually it will obstruct a medium sized arteries and cause rupture of capillary. So, patient presented with uh, hemoptosis or pulmonary hemorrhage and also is usually presented with uh, associated with left-sided heart failure uh, and also pulmonary infarct which cause diminished bronchial artery perfusion so this will cause backflow and cause uh, left-sided heart failure next it is caused by uh, it is blocked small and arteriolar pulmonary branches again it causes infarction of the uh, lung tissue and if there is, there is a multiple small emboli patient can present it with pulmonary hypertension and there's uh, backflow of the pulmonary hypertension will cause core pulmonary or um, enlargement or thickening of the uh, left sorry right sided uh, heart failure. So systemic thromboembolism is usually caused by the arteries, usually caused by the mural thrombi of the cardiac. Usually, eighty percent of cases uh, you can find mural thrombi of the cardiac in 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 the patients and apart from that the, if there is a aortic aneurysm or thrombi at the atherosclerotic plate and also if there is a valvular vegetation for example in a patient with infective endocarditis or rheumatic heart disease all of these factors is the causes or the sources for the systemic thromboembolism in the uh, caused by arteries and it can travel anywhere usually it can usually it will travel extremities in 75 uh, in the most uh, of the cases but sometimes end up with in the brain or cns and also other uh, organs for example intestine kidney and also spleen so if you are uh, posted in the orthopedic department and patient presented with a long bone fracture for example in femur so you need to be aware of fat emboli because um, apart from um, long bone fracture and also soft tissue uh, crush injuries so these are this these two kind of injury are the main source for fat emboli because fat uh, or adipocytes will become detached and enter the blood circulation and then uh, blocks the artery at the other side usually we will block the artery at the lungs and this this is one of the orthopedics emergency uh, that you will find during your practice or your posting so histologically you should remember that the you can find fat or adipocyte within the artery or vessels so in if if you take a look at the under the histological slides you can see fat within the artery or the vessel so these are the, uh, the symptoms of fat emboli, uh, sign and symptoms actually. So the collection of sign and symptoms will cause, will form a syndrome. So this is a fat emboli syndrome. You can see there is a pulmonary insufficiency where SpO2 will be dropped. Patient can present it with anemia and also some neurological symptom if the emboli blocks or become obstructed the artery in the 
brain. Apart from that, there will be some petechial rash or thrombocytopenia. And if it's severe enough, patient can um, become death or die due to the conditions. And you can sign symptom. You can see patient will have tachypnea, dyspnea, uh, tachycardia, irritability. This is due to CNS um, neurological symptoms. But also become apart from irritability, patient also become restless, delirium, and sometimes coma. So you need to suspect fat emboli if you had uh, encounter a patient with a long bone fracture or soft tissue crash injury and then presented with all of these signs and symptoms. So fat microemboli will occlude pulmonary and also cerebral microvasculature and because of this it will trigger platelet aggregations and lead uh, cause local toxic by fatty acid release by trapped adipocytes. So this trapped adipocytes become yeah, um, degenerated, ruptured and release all of the fatty acid and you can see also platelet activation and granulocyte recruitment and then this uh, release of uh, fatty acid will further damage the surrounding vessels and also tissue. Amniotic free emboli can be seen in intrapartum and also postpartum period uh, and occurs in 1 in 40,000 deliveries and is uh, the most common cause of maternal death and of course it, the consequences uh, apart from maternal death uh, mother who had suffered from am amniotic fluid emboli also had some neurological deficit it is important to identify the signs and symptoms of amniotic fluid emboli embolisms um, this is because it is an emergency and you need to act fast to uh, facilitate or prevent the complications of the emboli what you need to see if after within the intrapartum and also postpartum if you see a ma mother who had been suffering dyspnea, cyanose suddenly become hypotensive or even having seizure or coma the first thing you need to uh, think of uh, is the am amniotic fluid embolisms uh, because apart from that uh, the consequences is very um, severe because sometimes apart from the pulmonary effect which is patient can develop pulmonary edema the but the most severe complication is the the development of the IVC or release of thrombogenic substance from the amniotic fluid. This will further st uh, stimulate thrombogenesis and thus deplete all the uh, coagulation factors and uh, if uh, mother developed uh, the IVC or disseminated intravascular coagula coagulations she will uh, have will have uh, will has uh, spontaneous bleeding from uh, the mucus and or even the skin so this is a very um, serious condition and you need to identify it fast and uh, act on the on the consequences of the uh, amniotic fluid embolism and before we go or before you treat the patient you need to understand how does amniotic fluid embolism occur so it started with the tear in the placental membrane so during tear in the placental membrane the amniotic fluid will enter the circulation from the microvasculature and this amniotic fluid uh, will circulate will be, will be enter the circulation and will be in the circulation so um, because of uh, amniotic fluid contains a lot of uh, squamous, uh, uh, fetal squamous epithelia and also lanugo hair so this uh, and this substance will then blocks the blood vessels the smaller blood vessels and cause sign and symptom as I mentioned previously and uh, the squamous epithelia and also lanugo hair also will um, stimulate the thrombogenesis and cause the IVC or disseminated intravascular coagulations. 
So apart from fluids and also um, solid substances, gaseous material also can cause uh, embolism. So in this case, you you will find air embolisms. Uh, this is when a gas bubbles obstruct flow and cause distal ischemia. So even though it is a, in a gaseous material, because you know that our uh, blood circulation is in a fluid, fluid state. So any foreign material, for example, uh, air, can cause obstruction. And uh, usually this is caused by air trapped in the arteries, either during surgery or during uh, obstetric and gynecology surgeries uh, especially and sometimes decompression sickness for example in uh, if you um aware of a uh, scuba diving where the the diver who dive uh, under the deep sea they, they usually breathe in uh, a very compressed air from the uh, gas tank so this compressed air it, contain a lot and uh, is in a high pressure state so if the diver um, surface meaning going towards the surface uh, faster so the compressed air within his um, blood vessels will turn into gas, gas will, will form into a gas state so this gas gas uh, material will obstruct the vessels and cause uh, uh, air embolisms and the most important thing that um, why we worry about air embolism because this uh, condition is uh, usually fatal and patient or person can um, die due to air embolisms or even uh, or sometimes if he or she managed to survive there will be some ischemia of the tissue distal to the occlusions so a little bit on the pathogenesis of decompression sickness because decompression sickness is associated with air emboli. So again, this is uh, more related to the um, scuba diving uh, uh, persons who, who go for scuba diving. So um, as I mentioned previously, the scuba diver will breathe in a pressurized gas. So when there is an increased amount of gas dissolved in the uh, blood and tissue, blood and tissue, but uh, when he or she dive, uh, the pressure of the the atmospheric pressure in the water is very high, so it, it will cause the, the the pressurized gas to stay in a liquid form. But if the diver uh, ascend our surface fast, um, high amount of this the depressurized gas will will rap rapidly turn into gas so instead of it, it stay in liquid form it will turn into gas and this uh, depressurized gas will expand and become bubbles and cause gas emboli so this is what will blocks the arteries and also blood vessels so the next topic is infarction. So types of infarction can be divided into two. Either it is an arterial infarct or a venous infarct. So if it is caused by arterial infarct, usually the distal part that are caused by infarction will become white in color. And uh, if it is um, caused by venous infarct, usually the distal part of the obstruction or the infarcted part become reddish in color so the differences between ultra and venous infarct the usually ultra infarct is caused by thrombosis or embolisms and it is caused by uh, usually for example you can see the most common example is the myocardial infarction where the, there is a development of thrombosis within the coronary artery and it blocks the distal uh, it blocks the artery and cause infarction to the distal part of the myocardium so the outcome patient will have uh, ischemic on uh, ischemic heart disease or sometimes uh, ne necrotic or uh, yeah, necrotic heart, um, heart at the distal part of the obstruction in compared to the venous infarct usually caused by twisting of vessels 
and this is usually com co caused by compression by tumor or external mice or sometimes they can be caused by the torsion of the organs for example in the testicular torsion and or the ovarian uh, ovary torsion so this can cause a venous infarct for the outcome of the venous infarct because to this organ the 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 obstructed part is the venous part um, so there will be still be blood coming in into this organ so the organ will become reddish or purplish in color and become congested because of the the inflow of blood is continuously uh, uh, is not compromised it's just the out the the out the the veins that which is uh, affected so the blood flow from the organs towards the uh, main uh, venous is obstructed so the organ will become congested even though the uh, it is uh, caused by the obstruction of the vein the, it, the the organ will still has some degree of ischemic or infarct or sometimes become necrotic also So there are consequences of infarction. For, uh, number one is ischemic coagulative necrosis and also liquefactive necrosis. So these two type of necrosis is usually due to infarction. And the factors that influence the development of infarction is the nature of the vascular supply. So how does uh, vascular supply to that organ, for example, as I mentioned previously, um, if there is a uh, in a organ with a single efferent vein for example in ovary or testis so you can see that uh, there will be uh, some degree of venous infarction and number two is the rate of occlusion so how fast is the occlusion occur so if the occlusion occur very fast the the the, the development of infarct will become uh, even faster and also apart from that we can we can analyze that uh, we can we should um, assess the tissue vulnerability to ischemia for example in brain is very vulnerable to ischemia even a slight uh, infarction in will cause uh, tissue ischemia so that's that's what you need to see um, to assess uh, in view to it, in view uh, for you to, to 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 act on the infections for this patient uh, so that is about all about my lecture so we come back to our case so remember that a person a 30 year old male overweight uh, male gentleman admitted for meniscal repair and found that uh, after day five post operation so what happens to this patient actually So based on the autopsy findings, we can see that there is a mirror thrombi and also cellular emboli. So how does this condition happen? So based on uh, my lecture uh, today, on this lecture, so what are the most common conditions? What are, what are, how does this mirror thrombi and also cellular emboli uh, happen? To explain the, the cause of death or the formations of mural thrombi and also uh, pulmonary embolism, massive pulmonary embolism for this patient, you need to understand my lecture. So um, if you take a look at the, um, the history of the patient, patient is slightly overweight or, some, or obese and this should show that patient might have a high serum triglyceride uh, so this will cause hypercoagulability and the second one is obese or overweight patient tends to have a high fatty acid in his blood and this further will cause endothelial injury 
and this will further stimulate coagulation pathway. So the obese status for this patient is a risk factor for the development of thrombi and also pulmonary embolism. Plus, this patient had a history of prolonged immobilization due to um, the insertion of uh, epidural branula to his at his spine. So patient is difficult to move because if you put a branula into a, if you put a patient under epidural injection or branula, uh, patient usually are advised not to move around because uh, this, this will cause headache or dizziness for the patients. So due to that, there will be some prolonged immobilization in this patient. So prolonged immobilization will cause sluggishness and stasis of the blood flow within the veins. And this will further cause coagulation factors to expose to the endothelium and thus then activates the coagulation factors and form thrombogenesis or blood clot formations. So this is how you explain what happened in this patient. So it is important for you to understand properly this my lecture to help you in in uh, in managing this patient there are some preventive measures that can be taken to uh, correct or to prevent the formation of thrombosis in this patient because you know that this patient sh will have a prolonged immobilization uh, patient will have a uh, prolonged bed bed rest due to of epidural uh, epidural uh, in injections so you need to uh, overcome this by giving him anticoagulant anti or heparin or sometimes if you are there enough to insert in, in inferior vena cava filter which to filters all the blood clots um, in the blood then that is another uh, preventive measures but the most important thing is to encourage early mobilization. So maybe if the pain is tolerable, maybe you can off the or, or switch off or stop the uh, epidural injections uh, earlier and encourage patient to move uh, earlier. So that this uh, will prevent the formations of blood clot in the in the heart. Uh, and also co further cause uh, pulmonary embolisms. Okay, that's about it regarding my lecture. I'm Dr. Supajo Azmel from Department of Pathology and I hope you have a nice day and learn something from my lecture. Thank you and have a nice day.